as we are testing a new platform. Um, this webinar is going to last approximately one hour and 40 minutes. And I'm going to be presenting the research project that I've been working on for the past year um, on Indigenous peoples and climate change. And I just really want to thank the speakers who are with us today. Uh, we have really, really speakers. Um, Mr. Lakpa Nuri Sherpa from Nepal, who is currently working Hello. for the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. Yeah. I don't. Okay, I think so. Can you hear me? Okay, is it? Is it? Um, yeah. Can you hear? Me? Okay, great. Okay, <laughs> so <laughs> wonderful. So I want with um, talking about the question of who are indigenous people. The PowerPoint doesn't seem to work. Okay, there we go. So that was the first question we sought to answer um, as a team, which was who are indigenous peoples? And uh, because the term is quite impossible to define given the great diversity of indigenous peoples around the world, there are approximately 370 million indigenous peoples spread out across 70 countries, all of whom have unique traditions, beliefs, and social cultural characteristics. So very difficult to put them into any one category but the UN has put forward um, a set of characteristics to help us in understanding what it means to be indigenous. And the first is self-identification, um, a historical continuity with pre-colonial pre-settler societies. They have a strong link to their territories and surrounding natural resources. They have a distinct social, economic, and political system, distinctive language, culture, and belief. They often form the non-dominant group of a society, although in Bolivia, they are um, the majority. And indigenous peoples have a resolve to maintain and reproduce their ancestral environments and systems. Um, so they don't want to assimilate, they want to hold on to their identities and traditions. And Juliette, if you can just put it to the next slide. Thank you. So the impact of um, climate change on indigenous communities has been really, really devastating. They, these are people who are the most vulnerable populations to the effects of climate change, and they face its direct consequences. This is due to the fact that they are completely dependent upon their local environments and its resources. They, are, they live off the land, from the land, um, and the really sad thing is that these are people that have done absolutely nothing to create the problem, and yet they remain the most impacted by the activities and products of the Western world. Furthermore, climate change exacerbates the difficulties that are already being faced by indigenous communities. These include political and economic marginalization, loss of land and human rights violation, discrimination, and unemployment. And uh, Despite being the most impacted, they also have no real voice in the policy making or the climate negotiations that make the decisions for their land. So, um, yes, this is this is a, a very big problem. Juliette, could you go to the next slide? Thank you. So I'm going to go now just um, just region by region, giving just a very brief overview of how indigenous peoples are being impacted um, by climate change, starting first with Asia. In Asia, um, the temperatures are expected to rise between two to eight degrees Celsius, which furthers climatic variation, which includes a decrease in rainfall, crop failures, forest fires, all of which threatens biodiversity and indigenous livelihoods. Uh, next slide, Julia. In Africa, um, the, um, the traditional practices of cattle and goat farming can no longer survive in the context of desertification and drought. Um, and so there are already areas where indigenous peoples are forced to live around government drilled bores for water and that depend on government support for their survival. Food security is becoming a major issue for all indigenous peoples residing in deserts and who endure these prolonged, prolonged droughts. Next slide. In the Amazon basin, the effects of climate change include deforestation, 
forced fragmentation, um, both of which result in carbon released into the atmosphere and um, are really drastically affecting the livelihoods of indigenous peoples who live in the region and depend on these ecosystems. Next slide. Uh, you can skip this one and go to the Arctic. Yeah, perfect. Uh, the Arctic is the region that is experiencing some of the most severe and rapid climate change on Earth. Uh, indigenous peoples' whole culture is dependent on the cold and extreme weather conditions of the Arctic region. They depend on hunting for polar bears, walrus, seals, caribou, herding reindeer, fishing and gathering, not only to support the local economy, but also as a basis for their cultural and social identities. And all of this is already being severely impacted by climate change. Next slide. So as you can see, we are already seeing the devastating impacts of climate change on indigenous cultures. But despite the fact that they are the most vulnerable populations, they are also some of the most resilient. They have coped with climate variation for centuries and have tremendous adaptive capabilities that actually can be a great tool in mitigating climate change. Um, for instance, they have observations and interpretations that have been fine-tuned to a very localized scale um, and different early warning systems for extreme events that um, scientists are actually very interested in understanding more of. For instance, they can recognize signs such as wind direction, rainfall, temperature change, celestial movement, animal behavior, flowering of plants, and they're able to make very accurate predictions about their surroundings. Further, indigenous peoples are vital to and um, active in the many ecosystems um, and therefore can enhance the resilience of those ecosystems. Um, so for examples of this include, they can help with shoreline reinforcement, improved building technologies, rainwater harvesting, supplementary irrigation, traditional farming techniques, changing hunting and gathering periods, crop and livelihood diversification, use of community-based disaster reduction, risk reduction. Next slide. So while indigenous people's adaptation and mitigation is um, extremely valuable, the adaptation and mitigation being undertaken on the part of the international community um, has its own set of extremely negative consequences for indigenous communities. And once again, they have no real say in the dialogue and policy making that um, creates these practices. So for instance, hydroelectric power, something which we consider to be a source of green renewable energy that can be de generated domestically, has really heartbreaking consequences for indigenous peoples because as these dams are built, it often results in flooding villages, destroying farmlands and hunting grounds, and disrupting uh, fisheries. Uh, another threat is the program, which our experts are going to talk about in much greater detail, so I'm not really going to touch on it, and other agricultural initiatives, which are creating a diversity and food security. Next slide. So moving forward, um, there's really a need to include the perspectives of Indigenous peoples who are the closest to the land. There is so much we can learn about this race who is completely in balance and works with nature and actually enhances the resilience of nature. Um, and these are people who don't not inflict harm on their environments, but actually empower them. So cooperation between indigenous peoples, climate scientists needs to be put into place. Um, and there's just a real need to integrate them into the international climate negotiations and policy making process. Next slide. So the next part of my research that I'm working on right now is a case study on indigenous people's environmental preservation and policy making, or, um, sorry, and climate change in Canada. And this is because I'm studying a phenomenon that is happening uh, where we're seeing indigenous peoples rising up and using their legal rights under the Canadian constitution to retain autonomy over their land. Yeah, this is a topic that is um, I'm really, really passionate about because we're seeing Indigenous peoples 
taking back their land rights. And um, this is all happening around, next slide, Juliette, around the tar sands in Canada. Um, uh, next slide again. And the tar sands are the fastest growing source of greenhouse gas emissions in Canada. They are the biggest energy project in the world. They have the third largest oil reserve next to Saudi Arabia and Venezuela. They are an area that's the size of the state of Florida. And, um, and this is all taking place on the boreal forest, which is the second largest forest in the world, one of the lungs of the earth, completely um, destroyed for this production. So uh, next slide. The effect it's having on indigenous communities is is really, really catastrophic. It's an environmental catastrophe and an issue of human rights. Um, it's been termed suicide. Uh, the tar sands are located upstream of the Athabasca River, which is Canada's largest watershed. And so because of the toxic contamination, indigenous communities are um, essentially unable to live off the land because of the toxicity. And it's developing um, very, very rare cancers and diseases. So it's an ecological health crisis. So next slide, Juliette. So there's a pipeline that's been pro pro um, proposed from Alberta to Kitimat. So it would expand the Canadian Tarzan um, and increase its production. And what we're seeing is indigenous peoples coming together all across North America in alliances and also taking their cases to courts and winning. On June 26, 2014, the Supreme Court granted a declaration of the Silcotan Nation for over 17,050 um, square kilometers of territory. So this is the first time in Canadian history that su the Supreme Court has ever granted a declaration of Aboriginal title to a First Nation. Um, it's extremely precedent setting and has launched a whole series of court um, cases where Indigenous peoples are actually articulating their land rights and taking them to court and winning, and it's actually blockading these pipelines. And um, they're forming powerful alliances, um, which includes First Nations across BC, the US Pacific Northwest, Alberta, Yukon, and the Northwest Territories. And right now there's a coalition of 160 affected nations and they have together signed the Save the Fraser Declaration, which is an indigenous law declaration which bans tar sands pipelines from crossing rivers in BC. So we're seeing this unified force of indigenous nations across North America. And it's becoming um, very clear that actually utilizing indigenous legal rights is a means to prevent these mega corporations from continuing with their exploitation of natural resources. Uh, next. So basically, um, Aboriginal peoples are becoming just bigger players in the structural makeup of the state and central to the environmental and financial future of Canada. We are seeing an entirely new legal landscape for all unceded territories. And building more pipelines, which creates... So what I'm seeing in Canada and what I really want to study is Indigenous legal rights as providing a pathway to a more sustainable and environmentally sound world away from the industrial projects that are not supportive to a stable environment. And I'm asking myself the question if this could be precedent setting and indicative of a new future for Indigenous people around the world in reclaiming their rights. And uh, with that, I would like to turn to our question period. So, uh, welcoming on the call, uh, Lao Sakai, Mr. Lao Sakai, are you there? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Oh, welcome! Yay! <laughs> okay. <Woo>! So, um, <laughs> I watched so many of your um, YouTube videos, and I'm just so excited to have you on wow. this call. Like, wow, it's really, thank you. it's such. It's such an honor, really. I'm so excited. So wow, uh, I hope you could hear my. <laughs> um, I hope you could hear my presentation. I was a little bit. It was a little difficult with everyone coming in and out. But 
yeah, yeah, um, thank you. Yeah. I want to know about um, um, what's happening with indigenous peoples in your country and how you feel these issues can be addressed. So that's the first question. And the second is how we can include indigenous peoples in the international policy making and climate negotiations. So these are the, the three questions for you. Oh, uh, uh, first of all, of uh, what is happening uh, in my country is uh, just like uh, indigenous peoples across the globe. Uh, we are at the marginal area. We are marginalized socially, politically, uh, you know, uh, even environmentally. We live in the marginal areas that are really hostile, and therefore uh, the coping mechanism is comparably harder uh, than mainstream communities. Uh, so that's what is happening. Climate change is hitting us uh, uh, hardest compared to the mainstream societies. And how uh, we can be uh, the, the, uh, incorporated in the, in the, in the discussions, uh, I, I think, is what the current UN Special Rapporteur, uh, my friend uh, Vicky Tauli Coppers, says, it's time now to move from being victims to actors. Uh, so we really very actively, that's why I was honored for this invitation because it gives us voice uh, to highlight what we are, we are, we are going through uh, and be part of the solution. So I encourage indigenous people everywhere to use whatever uh, opportunities available, like the ones you have invited us, uh, you know, writing in their national uh, newspapers, you know, attending meetings, and make sure they, uh, they participate very actively. Mm, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And you are um, a lawyer studying international environmental law. So what international laws are available to protect and uphold indigenous rights and their traditional ways of life? Um, uh, and is yeah. that a viable means of pursuing uh, justice? Uh, in fact, the main international laws are one, the United Nations uh, uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, and uh, secondly, the ILO 169. The problem with Africa is that uh, uh, only one country out of 54 have ratified ILO 169, which is the main binding international instrument. But uh, good luck, we have a soft law. This is the declaration, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous people and the, uh, in totality it really provides very robust uh, uh, provisions on uh, respecting uh, indigenous people's uh, uh, land rights so we are using that we are creating awareness uh, among government officers and even uh, uh, the, and this is amazing I can't wait to say we are targeting judges we we, we teach that judges actually that you know there's a, a different way of seeing uh, indigenous people's rights compared the to rights of uh, mainstream societies. Beautiful. And how um, how do you think indigenous peoples can be more informed about the issues of climate change? Because there seems to be a lack of education, which is also inhibiting their ability to adapt and and to mitigate these effects. So how do you see education as factoring into this equation? Yeah, I think it's very important. It's very important we use uh, their traditional ways and traditional institutions, traditional languages to teach them of the looming dangers uh, of, uh, of, 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 of climate change. Because as you are saying, it's true, uh, awareness is lacking and the others would even attribute it to uh, completely different uh, factors. Uh, although uh, the coping mechanism, I must admit, uh, is really compatible. It can take them a, a little bit further in terms of vulnerability if policies would be aligned to respect their coping mechanisms that are traditional and embedded in the wisdom of using the land traditionally. Beautiful. Thank you. And you I want to yes, yeah. thank you so much. Now to uh, Mr. Nuri Sherpa, are you here? Yes. Wonderful. So um, I want to ask you about the Red Plus programs and whether you see this as a positive for Indigenous peoples or a negative, or how, um, yeah, how this can be incorporated as a as a, an equitable situation with Indigenous peoples and the international community. Okay. Uh, in relation to the discussions that we're having on climate change. Um, 
and of course the the, the climate change mitigations. Uh, one of the crucial issues that uh, uh, the indigenous peoples in Asia is facing is the legal recognition as indigenous peoples. As the previous speaker just uh, mentioned that we have the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, where most of the states from Asia have actually adopted the declarations. But in fact, uh, the translation, the actual implementation of those provisions inside the UN RIP is not taking place. Some of the states uh, in Asia even uh, uh, say that they don't have indigenous peoples, or sometimes they even say they all are indigenous. So there is a lack of um, political willingness to accept those groups who are asserting as indigenous peoples, as indigenous peoples. So in, 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 in relation to the climate change mitigations, for instance, red plus that, that uh, we are talking about now, one of the cr cr uh, key concerns of indigenous peoples is their traditional livelihoods. Of course, uh, your presentation has clearly mentioned that climate change is actually uh, affecting adversely their traditional livelihoods. But, in but some of the countries in Asia they are putting the traditional livelihoods of indigenous peoples as the factors that is contributing climate change. For instance, shifting cultivations, that's the traditional livelihoods of indigenous peoples that they have been practicing since hundreds of years. And that's, they're also the basis of source of food security. It's not just about traditional practice, it's, it's their way of life. The mm. traditional practice in, in, encapsulates their cultural practices, the spiritual uh, relations with the forest. But the, the, the issue in Asia is that they are putting the traditional livelihood as a factor which is creating climate change, so, which, is, which is really uh, uh, a, a big question uh, to see how, how the, uh, the countries in Asia, uh, when getting ready for Red Plus, will, will uh, ensure uh, uh, the traditional livelihoods of indigenous people. So uh, in, in relation to the climate change uh, solutions, uh, it is more the rights that should, the country should focus at in order to have a real solution to climate change. Okay, yeah. but how do you see this um, co um, coming together with the RED program specifically mm -hmm. as whether or not this is helpful or hurtful to indigenous peoples and their traditional ways of life? Uh, before the discussion of RED plus came, came there was the, the, the engagement with the government, particularly of indigenous peoples. In some countries, for instance, Vietnam and Cambodia was not that active. But with the advent of Red Plus, uh, because it deals about forests and that's where the indigenous peoples are, in a way, it has facilitated the engagement of indigenous peoples with, with the government. So we are not, at, at this point of time, we are not saying it will be very good or it will be very bad. But then the, the, the space to engage with the government, it, uh, the Red has facilitated that that uh, uh, space for engagement. So it's also up to the indigenous peoples, institutions to strengthen themselves and get organized and put the issues and concerns on the table when they discuss with the government. Hmm. Because I, I've been reading a lot about how it's creating a privatization of the forest and that indigenous peoples some, um, are somehow being blockaded from having the rights to the forest now as it's becoming more of a commodity um so i'm just wondering yeah. how yeah. it can be yeah, yeah you, you, actually you there is a about? there is a fear you now because the experience of indigenous peoples in asia because the the demarcation of forest as a conservation area the national park area has uh, really uh, those experiences has uh, given indigenous peoples like whether red will be, when red will take place whether the government will do the the same kind of experience whether they will demarcate that forest as the stock of carbon and that the the, the restriction will be put on their livelihood so threat that uh, in, uh, red can have to the livelihoods of indigenous people but the important thing here is the environment. so when indigenous people sit with the government or uh, during the dialogue about climate change mitigations that's that's the space that indigenous peoples are getting now, and uh, uh, we think that if if that space that is being uh, provided if used properly can actually be can be beneficial to indigenous peoples. Okay, I understand. So maybe what we'll do now. Thank you for answering my questions. Thank you. <laughs> um, 
is move into your presentations. And I think we have a little bit of extra time, um, given that Rebecca is not with us. So, um, Mr. Lal Sakai, are you there? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. I'm here. Beautiful. So, do you want to start? And Juliette, you can put up his presentation. Okay, cool. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm curious to hear um, your position on red too, because I know both of you are are sort of experts in this topic, and I'm wondering if there'll maybe be a, a difference of opinion or a way to maybe make even a bit of a debate out of it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay, thank you. Uh, Hi again, everyone. I am Lakhwani Risepa. Um, I'm from Nepal, but uh, I'm currently working with Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact, and I'm based in uh, Chiang Mai, Thailand. Next slide, please. Yeah. Okay. Uh, before we go into the topic, maybe I briefly uh, mention about uh, about Indi uh, Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact. Um, Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact um, is a regional organization of indigenous peoples uh, established in 1988. Okay, Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact is actually a membership-based uh, organization. Uh, we have 47 members, and we're working in 14 countries in Asia. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, uh, we have a climate change partnership uh, with indigenous peoples, uh, uh, and we. Uh, can you go back to the previous slide? Please? Okay. Okay. Sure. Yeah. So we work. Uh, we have our partners in different countries in Asia. So we work in Cambodia, Indonesia, Myanmar, Nepal, Thailand, and Vietnam with our partner organizations uh, under this climate change partnership. Okay. So. Uh, as we have uh, briefly discussed already about uh, the uh, about the climate change mitigation, one of the climate change mitigation that is Red Plus. So we have 13 countries, uh, Red Plus countries that are getting ready for Red Plus in Asia, and uh, in those countries there are more than 170 million indigenous people uh, in, in those Red Plus countries. As I mentioned earlier, that all of those countries uh, have actually adopted the United Nations declarations on the rights of indigenous peoples, except Bangladesh and Bhutan. But in terms of, of, of the uh, legal recognition of indigenous peoples and actually implementing the provisions of, of the declarations, uh, the, the government has uh, actually not, do, not uh, implemented those provisions. So yeah, next slide, please. OK, so I would like to. Uh, uh, present uh, the, from the experience of our members uh, and partners working in those countries, uh, we have identified some key issues and uh, concerns that indigenous peoples are facing in Red Plus. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Uh, one of the key discussions uh, that is being, uh, that is taking place in the context of Red Plus is about, uh, is about forest, definitely about forest. And the highlight, uh, most of the highlight is given to the forest, uh, the carbon of the forest. But for indigenous peoples, do not view forest just as carbon. For them, uh, forest is beyond carbon. For instance, what indigenous peoples uh, at the national level and also in the, in the international level had been advocating is for, is for the states to recognize the social cultural values of, of forests which are very integral to their uh, traditional livelihood system. But, so there is also an ongoing debate that the, actually for indigenous peoples, it, it's the non-carbon non benefit that matters uh, than, and, than carbon. So we don't just see forest with our physical eyes as carbon, but the, the, the forest should be viewed from also the perspective of indigenous peoples to, uh, to whom they have the social and uh, the spiritual relationship with the forest. So this is one of the, the key concerns that indigenous peoples have been facing uh, in the context of uh, Red Plus. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, as you know, the, the countries in uh, Asia are getting ready for Red Plus. So one of the things that they should be addressing is also the land tenure issues. But uh, 
in the actual experience of indigenous peoples in asia the 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 they don't have a very good experience in terms of the uh, the land because the land rights of indigenous peoples are constantly being violated uh, so that's one and another thing is also indigenous peoples have been conserving the forest with their own uh, practices since hundreds of years but that has not been uh, uh, acknowledged of, uh, properly uh, particularly the roles and contribution of indigenous uh, indigenous women next slide please yeah this is the one that i was discussing uh, before also because uh, the 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 government in Asia, they are actually trying to find out what are causing uh, the deforestation in their countries. So one of the, uh, the the drivers of deforestation that they have identified in their studies is, is shifting cultivation. For, for uh, I mean, for indigenous peoples, they have been doing this. Uh, they have been practicing this their traditional livelihood since many years, and and it is their source of, of food security and also the well-being of their communities. But their traditional livelihoods has been projected as as the contributor to climate change and the indigenous peoples who are actually practicing these traditional livelihoods are being arrested and put into the jail so this is a huge uh, is huge concern for indigenous peoples if red is implemented in, in asia how are the governments going to address this uh, this this uh, the livelihoods problem of indigenous peoples next slide please yeah and also the the information that uh, that are uh, available uh, at the national level uh, are also uh, mostly in english so the the production of information materials that in language that indigenous peoples can understand is very less and also there has been uh, the, the the effort from from the states to actually build the capacities of indigenous peoples on red plus is not happening sufficiently next slide please yeah so um uh, so with this uh with these key concerns of indigenous peoples in the background uh, as as uh, uh as climate change is uh, adversely affecting the uh, impact uh, adversely affecting the livelihoods of indigenous peoples the indigenous peoples representatives they also uh some of them are participating in the international uh, climate change negotiations where their participation and also with the support and solidarity of uh, the civil society organizations and some of the uh, friendly governments uh, uh, they, uh, during COP16 in Cancun, they were able to come out with the Cancun agreement where they have the specific social and environmental safeguards which are related to indigenous people. So one of the, the way forward uh, to address those key concerns that I have mentioned could be to implement the Cancun safeguards. Uh, so one of the safeguards, uh, one of the uh, safeguards from the Cancun agreement is the full and effective participation of indigenous peoples in all stages of Red Plus. For us, how do we interpret this full and effective participation of indigenous peoples? So for us, it is through the conduct of free prior and informed consent and also the representation of indigenous peoples in the relevant bodies at the national and also in the international level but when we talk about representation it is not just about the participation of indigenous peoples but also listening to them the uh, listening to them what they are saying and then actually putting those uh, the uh, the voices into the uh, policy making as well so meaning that indigenous people should have their say in, uh, in the decision making of red plus so it's not just about participating in those relevant bodies uh can we go to the next point yes so another uh the safeguards that we have in the cancun agreement is the respect for the rights and traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples so so how, how do we interpret uh, these uh, as indigenous peoples the respect for the rights and traditional knowledge of indigenous peoples this safeguards for us it means the legal re legal recognition and protection as i mentioned earlier one of the key concerns that indigenous peoples have in asia is the legal recognition because the government do not recognize them as indigenous peoples even though they assert themselves as indigenous peoples and another uh, uh, is also the, the the role that indigenous 
people, particularly indigenous women, are playing in the sustainable management of forests. Uh, uh, in context to the, uh, the traditional knowledge of uh, and rights of indigenous peoples, actually indigenous peoples have their own uh, way of uh, governing themselves to their customary laws and practices. So this has to be uh, recognized and respected uh, uh, by the states when they implement Red Plus in their countries. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Yeah. So how, how do we achieve this? How, how, how do we address the, the concerns that indigenous peoples have raised in, in preparation to the, to the climate change mitigation? So one of the options could be there should be a sustained dialogue between indigenous peoples and state for the policy review and reform especially relating to land because that's where our uh, traditional livelihoods are threatened. For instance, the picture, if you see the picture on the left, that's the, our partner in Myanmar who uh, recently uh, organized a dialogue with the government, uh, uh, especially in the context of Red Plus. So where, when the, uh, the indigenous peoples express their concerns about the participation because the government is now preparing uh, for Red Plus. So what, what, do, what do you see indigenous peoples being participated? So what is the role and responsibilities of government to address the issues and concerns of, concerns of indigenous peoples? Then um, the government, uh, because they are part of the UNFCCC policy and they have to implement the Cancun safeguards. So the government representatives were very open in terms of, uh, uh, of listening to what indigenous peoples were saying. And it's, it's also very positive that they, uh, they uh, to make sure that indigenous peoples are represented in the relevant bodies of Red Plus when they prepare for Red Plus. So that is one the positive thing that is taking place uh, in, in some of the countries in Asia. Uh, similarly, the uh, picture on the right is about the dialogue that indigenous peoples had in Red Plus in Bangladesh. A similar commitment uh, has been demonstrated by, by the government to actually uh, uh, to engage indigenous peoples in Red Plus. Uh, for me, one of the, uh, the, the very positive statement that the government representatives made in that dialogue is he, he, he was very uh, open and, and he frankly said that without the participation, without the capacity building of indigenous peoples, Red Plus in the country actually doesn't work. So it's, it's, uh, it's somehow the, 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 uh, the ad, uh, arrival of Red Plus in, in some countries in Asia has actually created, uh, facilitated a path for, for, for the engagement of indigenous peoples with, uh, with the government, uh, which uh, was not there before. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, we, we are uh, implementing the climate change partnership with our pa uh, partners in, in six countries in Asia. So we have also some experiences and lessons learned because we also produce the educational materials for indigenous peoples in those countries. We, we, we do the translation of those uh, educational materials in, in indigenous language and, and also in national languages. So uh, these are some of the lessons that, that we have learned uh, uh, from our uh, climate change partnership project. So the first thing is, is the use of local language because most of the, uh, the, the documents, research materials available is in English and, and, and English is not our native language. Most of the indigenous peoples even cannot understand the national language. So we, uh, we can imagine how they will understand the, the, the materials in English. So we need to really simplify the, those com concepts into, into, like for instance, what we do is we produce cartoons to put those, uh, um, those messages into simple form. We produce animation videos. Uh, we also make a documentary because for, for indigenous people, it's also, it's also about the literacy and then, then because if you give something to read, they may not be able to read also in some ca cases. So those are the things that we, that, that we have learned so far and our partners in the national levels are actually using the community radios, which is really uh, a very effective tool to, for awareness raising and also capacity building. And of course, we should include women and youth in, in those capacity building activities. Next slide, please. Yeah, and when we talk about the capacity building uh, and advocacy for indigenous people, right? Uh, what we have found is one of the, uh, the uh, one of the things that the government are hesitant to include indigenous people's rights or address their rights is also 
the lack of understanding about the indigenous people side so it's not just uh, to build the capacity of indigenous peoples but it is equally important and necessary to also build the capacity of the the state actors of on indigenous peoples rights so uh, that's one and another thing is because we are talking here about the representation of indigenous peoples in climate change uh, bodies and uh, yeah so it's also very important that we as indigenous peoples we have our own institutions we need to strengthen our institutions and also develop our skills uh, to do advo effective advocacy and and also see explore the the, the spaces that that has been uh, created and, and make uh, better use of it so that our voices are heard in the final uh, final uh, decisions that will uh, that will take place in the country level and also because we also need the support and solidarity of civil society uh, civil society organizations in our struggle uh, to in our struggle to make our voices heard so we also need to develop the networking and alliance building skills so we can uh, amplify our voices Another thing is uh, is because most of the indigenous peoples they, they don't have this formal uh, title of their land, but because I, I think it's it, uh, it, uh, the, uh, the same issue in all other regions of, of the world as well that mo government claim most of their land belongs to them. They own the land, they own the forest, but indigenous peoples were living in that forest before the, st before the states were formed. So it is very important for indigenous people to actually map their area and then say, okay, and then go to the government and, say, and, and, and present to them, okay, say, this is our territory and this is uh, our ancestral land. This is what that belongs to us and not to the government. So the community mapping is, is really a very uh, good uh, advocacy tool uh, for indigenous people to actually claim their lands and land rights. And, and of course, the documentation of, of their uh, uh, of their uh, area. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, I think this is more related. Next slide. Uh, one of the things that we have seen uh, as a regional organization, because we also need to change the attitude, uh, uh, the, the the attitude that the government sees towards indigenous peoples, because some of the government, as I mentioned earlier, they said they don't have indigenous peoples. So what we did in 2012 was we made an exchange visit where we invited the government, where we invited the uh, civil society organizations. And actually we did this uh, exchange visit in the community. Uh, the government were mostly from the forest department because we're talking about forest issues here. So we, we took them to the uh, communities. We ex actually um, in, uh, uh, gave, uh, provided them a space to and then Actually, they got this chance to see the how the indigenous natural resource management and also doing the traditional livelihoods. So, the one of the results that came out from that uh, exchange visit was also was that the, it, it 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 was very positive to see the change that we found with uh, with the government before the exchange visit and after the exchange visit. Uh, it, it's very good. Indigenous peoples are actually managing the resource uh, sustainably. It is not what we thought before. So it's 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 the the exchange visit also could be one of the uh, um, the ways <laughs> to to to, uh, to correct those uh, the 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 attitude towards indigenous peoples and their livelihood. Uh, as a regional organization, we also make submissions. We do uh, submit our position papers to the UN. Uh, of, of course, recently the one we made was a non-carbon benefit and, and unsafeguard information systems that we for the key uh, agenda that will be discussed in the upcoming uh, conference of parties in in Peru. And 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 while engaging with the government, I think we also need to define the indicator so that we can track what is the progress uh, uh, that we have made. Yeah. Next slide, please. Yeah. So this is, uh, we have a network on climate change uh, monitoring uh, and information where do we, we, we share the, uh, the information on climate change uh, and the, the uh, and it, we, we can see the websites there. And also we, you can access all the climate change and red plus the animation videos that we have made. It is also available in different national and indigenous languages. 
we have the Twitter and we also have the Facebook uh, page where we regularly update the, the work that our members and partners uh, are doing in, in the national level. Next slide, please. Yeah, as, uh, just, just to conclude that the, most of the speakers have already articulated the, the, the adverse impact that indigenous peoples have faced because of climate change. So though they don't have any contributions to, to the other one actually facing the, the impacts. So when the governments are actually now drafting the climate change adaptation plan, they are now making policies on climate change mitigation action, for instance, in Red Plus. So without the participation of indigenous peoples, if, if they didn't allow the, the participation of indigenous peoples in decision making, then they will be, the, they will be victimized twice. For climate change, they, they, are, they are being impacted. And also the climate change solutions, for instance, the, you mentioned about the, 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 the issue of dam because it has been considered as one of the uh, clean energy and that, that has given a license for the government to actually build more dams for, uh, and, and that is really impacting the, the cultural and the livelihood dimensions of indigenous people. So to conclude my presentations, uh, I would like to state that without protecting the livelihoods, without protecting the rights of indigenous peoples, without uh, uh, respecting and fulfilling the collective rights of indigenous peoples, any climate change solutions uh, would not work. Uh, and then, yeah, thank you. Yeah, that concludes my presentation. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. That was a very, very uh, in-depth comprehensive look at Red Plus in Asia. Thank you. Um, we're going to turn now to listen to uh, Mr. Lal Takai. Um, are you with us? Yeah, I'm all right, yeah. Wonderful. So we, we listen to you. All right. Yeah. Well, uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you also, LACPA. LACPA is really uh, nice to uh, hear uh, your good work. I've been to Chiang Mai. I've, uh, I'm a very uh, a big fan of what you guys are doing. And in fact, in Africa, we learn a lot uh, uh, from you. I need to very much highlight the issue of uh, recognition that you have uh, uh, said it very well. It's uh, actually uh, even a bigger because uh, very few countries in Africa compared to Asia uh, really recognize indigenous people's rights. Uh, so that is, uh, is our main challenge. Uh, can you hear me, everyone? Yes, yeah. I hear you. Carry on. It's perfect. Perfect. Okay. Yeah. So uh, just before I start, uh, who are indigenous people in Tanzania, I also wanted to mention uh, uh, in, uh, very uh, uh, briefly about ALAPA, my organization, Association for Law in the Advocacy. Uh, that it is a national organization and we deal uh, with all uh, uh, development related aspects of indigenous people and our strength is uh, using legal uh, tools uh, uh, to advocate for amendment of bad laws to negotiate and they have uh, legal eyes on every uh, document to analyze them uh, and they give legal opinion. So when we look at the red, we look at climate change mitigation measures, we look at uh, uh, constructions of roads, we look at uh, you know plans for expansion of national parks, then our eyes would be the law, what is the legal implication? And if need be, then we go to court uh, to defend our people. So. Uh, who are indigenous people uh, in Tanzania. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, indigenous people uh, in Tanzania, uh, that is a map uh, uh, of Africa, and you can see Tanzania uh, just uh, uh, down the equator, the line that runs uh, through Kenya, it, you can see my, my country. Next slide. Yes, uh, pastoralists are uh, uh, one livelihood that is practiced by, 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 by indigenous people in Tanzania. You can see that is a, is a hut, is a house uh, built uh, uh, for, for a pastoralist. Uh, 
few of them now have permanent residence, but uh, most uh, are these kinds of uh, houses that are not uh, less important because they take advantage of uh, uh, the ecosystem and the lifestyle that necessitate moving uh, from one place to, to the other. Next slide, please. Yes, hunter gatherers. This is another community of indigenous people in Tanzania. They actually live. Uh, they depend on uh, collecting fruits and uh, you know hunting uh, very sustainably. Uh, in fact, they don't kill uh, any animals. They very much specify, and this is uh, inherited uh, by communities down the, 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 the generations on how they should respect. And nature in order to feed them. Next slide, please. Yes, those are elders. You can see them. Uh, those are the ones that are charged actually with the uh, passing knowledge uh, of uh, conservation to the next generation. Next slide. Yeah, so in summary, the African Commission on Human and People's Rights, this is a regional body that is charged with uh, observing and uh, promoting human rights in the continent, uh, has come up with uh, uh, four uh, communities, the Hadzabe and the Akie, as well as the Maasai and the Tatoga. The first two groups comprise the hunter-gatherers that I've shown you pictures, and the Two others are pastoralists. They are mobile uh, 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 people who move constantly with their livestock in search of uh, uh, water and pastures, and they also as a coping mechanism against the uh, impacts of climate change. Next slide. Uh, so why are they uh, most valuable? outlined uh, very few uh, points, although uh, with questions and the answers I can add most, but uh, one is incompatible mitigation policy options, and the another is livelihood options, and the third one, uh, next slide. is a poverty or non dominance group. So uh, can we go back? I start with the first uh, point. What do I mean here is that uh, the government comes up with uh, some mitigation measures, how to deal with the impacts of climate change. And I'm saying these mitigation impacts, as Lakta has said, are even more destructive than climate change uh, itself. And to be more concrete, I want to give you an example that in 2006, uh, uh, the government came up with a strategy aimed at uh, uh, you know, uh, solving problems in the water catchment areas. And the victims of that uh, strategy were pastoralists. In hundreds, they were forcefully evicted from their lands. They were made landless. They were not compensated. And they become poorer than even what climate change could, uh, could cause. Next slide. Another is their livelihood options. As I said, hunting or gathering solely depends on nature. You, it's like a, a city dweller with his ATM. You know, you, you, you are looking at the, you have money in the bank, and this hunter gatherer is looking at the ecosystem, the forest is large, as the, the sole livelihood options. And therefore, when there, there are no fruits, when there's drought, they become really vulnerable because it is just like a, a city, a, a city dweller losing all his money uh, in a bank. You cannot access. So uh, it's really uh, difficult for them to cope uh, when climate change uh, is not addressed properly. And the same applies to pastoralists because they depend on nature. They want to move from one place to another when the grasses dry up and water sources. In fact, they, they become more vulnerable due to their livelihood options compared, for example, from a farmer uh, or a salary earner who can, uh, you know, even uh, go online and uh, uh, order food if it is not available in his vicinity. Next slide. 
Another is poverty, and I think this highlights all uh, is cross-cutting. It's the same in uh, all countries uh, where there are no there are indigenous people. Indigenous people, by their very nature, are non-dominant, uh, and they live in environment. Uh, uh, indigenous peoples in my country, for example, they constitute the poorest. Uh, and they are not dominant, so they cannot influence policy making. And to be, you know, uh, to add salt in the wound, you know, uh, these mitigation measures, as I said, they are agreed upon without uh, 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 consulting them. And so, compounded by hard laws, you know, that uh, even uh, tended to. A, a victim and a, a nation, I mean, a, a, a take their lands and make them part of the national parks, they find themselves really at the uh, hardest uh, places in, 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 meet, in coping against the impacts of climate change. And I know I don't have uh, uh, time, but just to mention, for example, the impact of, uh, of, of uh, measures uh, for conserving uh, uh, indigenous people's lands. A lot of land in Tanzania has been converted into national parks. And much as wildlife would come to village land and uh, drink water and uh, uh, eat grasses, uh, livestock cannot go to the national parks even during uh, uh, acute drought. And this has been one single cause of death for livestock because if we had friendly laws, friendly policies, uh, we could uh, access uh, uh, water uh, on the buffer zone just uh, across the national parks and we could uh, have solved a lot uh, of these problems. Thank you. I I'll probably continue uh, during questions and the answers uh, session. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Lausakai. That was an incredible presentation. You're so, welcome. So this is, as I understand it, and I can try to speak a little bit to her PowerPoint, um, uh, about what's happening in Canada and specifically in BC to unify First Nations. So I don't know if this video will work, but let's see if it does. Oh, no, unfortunately, the sound didn't work. Does the sound work? No, the sound doesn't work. Anyway, we're see what we're seeing is huge protests across Canada that are um, that are um, what's the word advocating against the pipelines in BC. You can go to the next slide because I don't think watching this video is necessary. So you can see. Oh wait, you can hear it. Okay. No Tatiana, do you want to speak? Yes. Okay. Next. Go to the. Yes. Okay. Do you want to watch? No, just go to the next one. This one's talking about the protest in New York um, and what happened with all the peoples around the world uniting against climate change. And I, I do my best with this presentation. I've never really seen it before. Okay. <laughs> Uh, do, do you want to, to see the video, to watch the, the video or no? Uh, I don't think so because we can't hear it unless you can hear it, um, but I don't think the sound is working. Okay, so we don't watch it. No, just carry on. Okay. So these are the, the principles that the First Nations are advocating for um, in terms of protesting the pipeline, which is starting from within, working in a circle, um, in a sacred manner, and, we, uh, and in this way we heal ourselves, our relationships, and our world. And so they're really advocating for a spirituality and a spiritual approach to um, being in harmony and in balance with nature and, um, and building these alliances across North America. Next slide. So oh, it's going to go, I think it's going into deep. Keep going. So these are all the organizations that are um, 
taking part across North America. We have the Idle No More to Change Everything We Need Everyone, the People's Climate Change March, um, all of these coalitions which are coming together, coalescing against uh, Tarzan's expansion, and all of it led by First Nations Peoples United. So carry on. And in the Pacific Northwest, as I mentioned, there is a pipeline that's been proposed from Alberta to Kitimat. And this pipeline would cross over 1,000 rivers and crosses four indigenous territories. Juliet, can you take um, your mute? Put on your mute. Stay on this one. Um, so, save the Fraser Declaration, which 160 nations signed together, uh, which is to protect the BC waters from the tar sands oil expansion. And um, and it's it's basically um, quite an incredible thing where we're talking a lot about Indigenous people standing up for their rights, really, really claiming um, their inherent self determination over these lands and territories. And now we're seeing this really, really being demonstrated in Canada, where they're really standing up um, very strong and actually taking legal action, and that's winning in the courts because the so Coton case actually won and that territory is now completely under their jurisdiction. And so these coalitions are actually being tremendously effective and the First Nations are really gaining in power and um, potential. Carry on. So that's a map of the pipeline, which goes from Fort McMurray to BC. Now you can keep going. Um, yeah, I guess that's more a detailed map. And um, it's very interesting because, as we know, we, uh, Tarzan's pipelines cannot coexist in the context of a safe environment. And we absolutely have to switch off of fossil fuels and move to more renewable forms of energy. And uh, Indigenous peoples are actually providing the, the political uh, fortitude to actually blockade these projects because right now these projects are being blockaded and here um, you can keep going this is just describing I guess the impacts on ecosystems of the Tino Morgan pipeline so these slides are talking more about the treaties um, yeah more on the treaties keep going So um, Natsamat Alliance, which is the alliance that Rebecca's a part of, and I'm sort of doing this presentation for her, but I hope I'm doing it justice, um, is a top-down legal political um, strategy to stop the Tarzans and the expansion of oil and to unify Indigenous peoples. And it's created an incredible solidarity network. So carry on. Yeah, this is, keep going. You can maybe just flip through these. Oh yeah, this, so this is the, can you go back to the first one, uh, last one, Julia? So this is really, really incredible because um, it's the first time the Supreme Court of Canada is granting First Nations um, Aboriginal title over their lands and territories. That means that no development resource extraction projects can take place on their lands without consent. And before that, they um, projects could take place if First Nations were just simply consulted. So that meant that so many logging, mining, all these resource extractive processes were taking place on Indigenous territories, um, and they had absolutely no say and no power over these um, activities. But now with with what's happening in and how indigenous peoples are being backed by law, they're actually gaining the autonomy over these lands and winning court cases. And it's really, I, I don't know anywhere else that this is really taking place. And I, I very much hope it's a precedent setting situation. So uh, carry on. Um, keep going.
Uh, I don't know what that is. Keep going. Yeah, and I guess the main point is that this is all grassroots initiatives. This is all people from the bottom up challenging these large scale corporations. And um, Indigenous peoples in Canada are becoming much more educated. And so they're being backed by, by actual power that's operating within the system in a sense. And these are some of the initiatives, which is survival of the kindness, kindest. I really like that. Um, I don't know very much about what Rebecca has here, so keep going. And keep going. Yeah, and it's it's um, there's lots of tours happening across Canada, Indigenous peoples going across Canada and spreading awareness of what's happening here and, and building the network. And um, these tours are just gaining in momentum and keep going. Um, yep, so one heart, one house, one prayer, united in the power to protect the sacred, keep going. And again, we're at the North Alliance. And okay, opportunities for collaboration, legal and political actions, which include treaty signing, ceremonies with allies, elected leader summits, marine sanctuary referendums, public awareness campaigns, um, the Salish Sea tour with town hall meetings, implementing green technologies, and continued alliance building. Keep going. So this, I think, concludes Rebecca's presentation. So I'm very sad she could not be with us, and I hope that I was able to present some of her points. And we can turn now to questions from the public. Are there any questions for our amazing speakers? Juliet, do you know if there's questions coming? Juliet? Yes, if someone has questions, you can just turn on his microphone and ask his question. Hmm. I think so. Um, well, I have some questions. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my first one is for Mr. Lal Sakai. Yes. Hello. Hello. Hello, hello. <laughs> Yeah. Hello, hello. So um, there, there is a lot of uh, corruption in government. Oh, um, Juliet, can you mute yourself again? I can hear you. You can hear me? Okay, great. Yes, yes. Um, I'm wondering how um, government corruption can be addressed and how um, indigenous political rights can be enforced. You, uh, I'm, I'm very interested in like the legal initiatives that can be taken on the part of the international community to really protect indigenous rights and rights to land. And um, so I'm wondering, you mentioned those uh, legally binding agreements in the UN, but how can these actually be enforced? How can these actually be upheld? Because we're seeing all these declarations coming out of the UN that aren't being, that aren't being adhered to whatsoever. So how can this actually be implemented? Oh, a very good question. In fact, uh, the whole purpose of uh, international human rights law is to influence uh, actions locally. So uh, all our efforts uh, with the UN in Geneva, in New York, whatever, is to make sure that uh, such uh, good standards are translated uh, locally. Uh, so, for example, as Lakpa has said, we are also working very uh, closely with governments to uh, raise awareness and make sure, uh, for example, they, uh, they, they, they ratify ILO 169, with the, which is a binding document, and also adapt in their implementation plans uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And uh, the most important thing, as I said, is now how those can be used locally. So we had a training of judges a couple of uh, months ago. I traveled back home and uh, 
took part as a co-trainer to train the judges on how they can use these international tools to sort of add values to the, the, the available uh, laws uh, at home. Uh, and uh, as you said, corruption can be a stumbling block, so we can we deal with them uh, the, the concurrently. Instead of just focusing on indigenous people's issues and challenges, we are looking at the welfare of the nation generally by working with the like-minded organizations that fight uh, corruption as well. Okay, so you're you're not so much going at it from um, in, uh, um, enforcing these policies in government, but more through like grassroots organizations or through these kind of non-profit organizations, or how is it being? Yes, in fact, Alapa is a non-profit organization, so we work with communities because our communities go into a lot of agreements with a wide range of actors, including big international conservation agencies, uh, oil and gas companies, uh, forest and uh, sorry to call them loggers, and so on and so forth. So before they agree on a logging or hunting concession, we look at the legal implications and how they can be benefit more uh, through interpretation of the laws. And if they they enter into a problem, then we can go to court uh, to look for how uh, they can uh, have their rights addressed according to the laws of Tanzania, as well as uh, international human rights standards. And are you seeing that happening? Are there success stories? Is it actually um, taking a root? or is it still in the process of, of being uh, a successful uh, here and there, here and there, uh, what gives us, uh, what energizes me is that I'm really hopeful that uh, things will change. And I think this is what also Professor Jim and I once said in an interview. Uh, most of us activists really uh, uh, hope for, uh, are hopeful that uh, things will change. For example, in Tanzania now we have a new constitution uh, which is about to be passed in a referendum. And uh, through our advocacy and fight and the engagement, we have managed to influence uh, indigenous people's rights. So we have very uh, robust provisions, and uh, that is a success for us as well. It will change things uh, compared to uh, how we used to operate in a vacuum. Hmm, that's amazing. And um, before I turn to uh, Mary Sherpa, I, I'm curious about, do you have like a, a, a position on RED? Is, do you see it as more harmful or more good, or how do you, is this the way for the future in terms of protecting forests and also protecting indigenous rights? Can you coalesce? Uh, the problem with the red, uh, in fact, uh, I, I, I really, that's one of the most difficult questions because I, I I'm not, uh, uh, I'm not too optimistic. Uh, because uh, people, they, they just somewhere they can go in agreement with indigenous people's rights. And, uh, you know, they, they have a lot of hesitations as well. Uh, so I'm really opposed to the idea, uh, first and foremost, of, uh, you know, uh, restricting indigenous people's uh, uh, livelihood at the expense of, uh, you know, uh, uh, continuing polluting elsewhere. So conceptually, uh, I think there is a problem. But uh, uh, because it's something that uh, is good at the end, we, the, 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 the final product, meaning reducing emission from deforestation, is something everyone can support. I think it's important we engage all of us collectively in good faith and see how it is not turned into something that will affect indigenous peoples more. I served at the policy board of the UN Red at the global level representing Africa, and that gave me more questions than answers because you see a lot of other actors who are not really willing to also respect indigenous people's rights despite agreeing on paper. Yeah, thank you. You're uh, welcome. Thank you so much for your expertise. It's, it's really, uh, really a pleasure to hear you. Um, Likewise, I'm, I'm humbled for the invitation. Ah, uh, we're so yeah. I'm. I was watching um, some of your talks on 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 Red on on YouTube, and it was very inspiring. So. Oh, uh, my my pleasure. 
um, so, uh, Mr. Norishupa, do you hear me? Yeah. Yes. Are you still with us? Okay. Yes. Um, wonderful. So, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, how to increase awareness of climate change and red amongst indigenous peoples and and build their capacity to really participate in the development of, of red strategies. Because you touched a little bit on it, and I'm just wondering if you could highlight a little bit more on that topic. Yeah. Actually, uh, uh, before I uh, r respond to the, your question on how to build the capacity of indigenous peoples, uh, in relation to also like uh, the question that you asked to uh, Lal uh, Laltaikai Lal about yeah. uh, how to uh, to actually um, implement that uh, the the UN Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So, uh, of course, uh, like he has already mentioned, it's uh, uh, like the lack of understanding about indigenous people's side with the state and non-state actors. But uh, as a regional organization, what we have also been doing is, actually we have developed a, a manual on how actually indigenous peoples can use that manual in English. And then we have translated that manual into the indigenous languages and the national languages that the communities can understand. Because it is very important, besides the political will of the government to implement that pro uh, the, the declaration, the, there should be a strong pressure also from the communities to actually uh, ask the government to implement those uh, uh, implement that declaration. So unless the communities are fully aware what are the rights, what actually they can ask for the government, it's it's really difficult to uh, realize th that situation where uh, the government will actually implement. So I think uh, there are two aspects: that one from the government and another from the communities itself. Uh, 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 yeah. Uh, in relation to the the capacity building uh, uh, of indigenous uh, peoples in climate change and red plus, uh, what we have done so far, uh, as I mentioned, that we have this climate change partnership with our members in uh, six countries in Asia. What we have been doing is we are producing the the educational materials, uh, uh, like for instance, as I mentioned, the animation video on climate change, uh, the training manual on climate change, uh, and we do the training. And yeah. we organize a regional training on climate change and indigenous peoples, where we invite the 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 our members uh, from those countries. So we will give a rigorous training uh, to them at the national level and uh, not at the regional level. Yeah. So what our members will do is go back to the communities and then replicate those trainings. Um, uh, but of course, we do develop the training manual for them, and they will go back to the country. They will translate. And localize the training manual in their in, in in the context of their country, and give the uh, the training to the communities in, in the context of that particular country. Uh, besides that, what we have been doing, as I mentioned earlier, also we have been uh, using the media because, for instance, in case of Nepal, we have the network of indigenous journalists, federation of network of indigenous journalists, where they have their network in all the countries in all the different parts in all the districts of the country. So we use that network to actually do the awareness raising. We produce uh, the, the radio materials at the national level and we distribute through that network uh, uh, to actually, uh, uh, because we have the very good community radio uh, net uh, in, in Nepal. So that, that's, that's the kind of uh, the, uh, the uh, tools that we have been using. And another thing that we have done is also the use of the songs, because when when you need to uh, 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 get the attention of the not only indigenous peoples but also the, the 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 actors that you should influence, I think the 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 uses of songs and videos are very very uh, important. Uh, in addition to that, what we have done is also we have actually uh, discussed and uh, uh, negotiated with also the. The local governments uh, in the ground to actually include the, the the issues of indigenous peoples and climate change into the the school curriculum. So that has been really uh, uh, very uh, uh, effective in terms of not only educating uh, the, the 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 civil society and organizations, but also we start from the schools to educate the the, the students also about what are the communities uh, are facing in terms of climate change and what are the leaders are actually doing in in in. Uh, to uh, to to assert their rights in climate change. 
So these are the things that, uh, that, 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 that our climate change partnerships are actually doing uh, to raise awareness on climate change and that plus. And also, of course, we do uh, uh, try to explore the space that our members in the national level can actually participate in the climate change processes. And also sometimes we facilitate their participation in the international processes. Thank you. Wow, that is, that is a lot of work and uh, it sounds like it's being very successful. Would you say that, um, ha, do you feel that there's progress being made? Do you feel optimistic about the future for indigenous people's rights being consolidated on the international scale? Are you seeing, yeah, are you basically, are you seeing progress and what's your, your um, ultimate vision for how this can proceed? Uh, and in terms of, of climate change, um, as I mentioned earlier also, there is very uh, uh, less participation of indigenous peoples in the international climate change negotiations because of there are several factors. It's, it's about funding who will fund us to, to be there and speak for our communities. That's, that's, that's the first thing. And also because in the international negotiation on climate change, we are just observers. So we need to develop a strategy as an indigenous people, how to actually influence the negotiators with our, uh, with our messages. So just to inform you, there is an International Indigenous Peoples Forum on Climate Change where indigenous peoples of Asia, Africa, Latin America, they gather together and then they develop their positions on climate change adaptations and mitigation. So, uh, so the development so far has been, uh, like I, I said uh, about the, the, the Cancun agreements where there are specific uh, environmental and social safeguards on indigenous peoples. So it has a lot to do with how uh, the, uh, the, the openness uh, and willingness of, of the countries to actually uh, the, to respect and protect the rights of indigenous peoples. But it is also very important from our end to actually sustain our advocacy that we have been uh, doing at the national level and also at the regional level. So, uh, so th that depends a lot of, uh, on a lot of factors, but we have to keep uh, sustaining our advocacy. So uh, I think with our... Continuing uh, engagement uh, from at all levels will definitely make a difference, and we should keep doing that. Uh, like for, uh, I'd like to just give an example. Uh, that, uh, like you said, there there has never been a case where the first uh, the nations were not given the community land titles, right? So, like for instance, in case of Indonesia, before the there was a, a law where it that all the forest belongs to the state but then our members Aman they did the advocacy and then they filed uh, a, a case in the court and then in 2013 May 16 the court decided that the customary forest belongs to indigenous people so that means the forest customary forest no longer belongs to the state it actually belongs to the indigenous people so those are the, uh, the, the, uh, the positive developments that are taking place uh, in, in, in Asia. So we're all uh, optimistic uh, that uh, indigenous people can actually have that strength and power if we are organized and, and, and can make that difference to, to uh, achieve the land rights and forest rights that we have been advocating for. Hmm. And what would you uh, advise, I'm going to ask this question to both of you, but for the young people on this call, and this call will be recorded and, and proliferated <laughs> through our network. So, um, and so for those of us who really want to undertake meaningful action towards supporting indigenous communities and their rights and, and really being advocates for this um, really, really important topic, how, how would you advise us? How can we proceed? How can we act as change makers in this, in this field? Uh, yes, uh, you asked him about uh, being change makers. Yeah, yes. I'm. I'm wondering um, what you see as actions that can be undertaken by this next generation, those of us who are really here to affect change and to support indigenous peoples worldwide, and how we can really um, take a stand on this issue and what's needed, and yeah, basically how we can proceed. Uh, in fact, uh, there is a tendency uh, for uh, the uh, 
people living in the in the first world in the west to really think this is a problem of uh, people out there so i think the next generation should be able to know that this is a global problem that require global solution and the upon realizing that it's very important now they develop a habit of uh, following up on these issues and making their their point uh, and their voices heard uh, for example when they say uh, 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 a conference of the United Nations uh, uh, conference on climate uh, on climate change. They should be able to follow up and uh, make their inputs and also uh, 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 talk against some mechanisms that they would really know that they affect people regardless of whether uh, they live in their country or not. Uh, so I think f uh, my message to the young men and women listening to me is really to know that uh, much as uh, indigenous people are more vulnerable than an anyone else, but this is a, glo is a global uh, problem that is going to affect over all of us, and therefore we should all take actions, we should all uh, be participants, we should all uh, uh, do whatever we can uh, to, 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 uh, make it, to keep it in check. Yes, I couldn't agree more. And so do you see our role um, in the West as being one of education, as one of awareness building, or as one of, 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 you know, like how do we create more effective solidarity networks that can um, really be uh, change, change agents in this field? One is to make your position very clear. In fact, you are better positioned than uh, folks living in the third world countries in terms of technology, in terms of uh, finances. Uh, you can attend meetings, you can uh, convene uh, uh, conferences, even online. So you should be able to uh, take those opportunities to really connect with folks in the uh, developing country, know their problems, know how you can uh, uh, channel them in the conferences, and if possible, support them to come uh, and, and attend these conferences, because most of them are held in, in big cities, uh, in, uh, in, in developing, in developed countries and the folks out there cannot come. So it is important uh, they are also being supported. Organizations like uh, TEBTEBA that brings uh, indigenous people from uh, diverse uh, places can also be uh, given the capability to do so in big numbers so that indigenous people from all over the world can come uh, attend these meetings and make their voices uh, uh, heard. Okay, we'll be right on that. <laughs> Good. Thank, you. Thank you so much. And I just have one last question, which is kind of a personal one for me, which is um, I did part of my degree in ethnomusicology and I really, really studied the music that's coming out of Africa, and um, I'm wondering if there's a place for the arts in facilitating this this crossover, this change in supporting indigenous rights, and how can their culture and their music and their ways of life sort of be um, presented to the Western world in, in a really um, supportive way, but in an awareness building um, way? Like, wow. Is there a place for music and culture in this? Wow, I'm really impressed. I, I really like that because I don't know any other cross-cutting thing like music. It's contagious. And, uh, you know, the Masa in particular have been able to trans transform, I mean, a, a, a lot of ways of life through music. And uh, you can see even in the government using a pop artist because it's the most effective way to reach people. Uh, we haven't explored that uh, as a lapa in my organization that this is something I would really love to work with you and see how uh, we can, uh, you know, introduce that idea of how uh, they can use their music to also, you know, encourage the younger generation uh, to take actions and become uh, 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 agents of change, as you have pointed out. Oh, wow. I love, I love that. Okay, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm very, very inspired by this after studying the music that's coming out of Africa and it's, it's just such a rich, rich culture that the indigenous peoples have preserved that feels like it needs to be shared with the world in some way and that that could really facilitate their, you know, their, their voices being heard. 
Precisely, precisely. Please uh, write me email. Let's see how we can really revitalize this and, uh, and make it happen. Okay, I love it. Yes, I, will, yes. I will do so. Okay, Excellent. well, thank you so much for being on this call. We're, we're so, so humbled and, and honored to have your wisdom and expertise with us. And if Laps is still there and Rebecca, it's just, just so much uh, gratitude for this time you're taking to speak with us. And um, I will definitely be in touch with you, um, especially about this project, and yeah. um, uh, look forward to meeting you one day. So wonderful, lots, wonderful. Lots and lots of love, and let's keep changing yeah. the world for the better. Excellent. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everyone, as well, who's on the call, and um, thank the you. Work that organized thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. And we are sorry for Rebecca because we yeah. wanted to hear her. But Hopefully, I did her um, uh, presentation okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> and thank you for everyone. It was really very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Thank, you. So, thank you so much. Bye. And, bye, uh, bye. Bye for now. Bye. 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 bye.